Welcome to Viewpoint on ILTV, where we bring you some of the leading voices in the Middle East and beyond. In this special, we're taking you inside the Israel-Gaza war to hear from stakeholders, thought leaders, and decision makers. I'm Emily Schrader, and today we're speaking with renowned author and journalist Douglas Murray. Douglas has been a leading voice throughout the Israel-Gaza war, having spent weeks speaking to survivors, former hostages, IDF officials, and even Prime Minister Netanyahu. Douglas has also been one of the most outspoken voices of sanity in the international media when it comes to the extreme accusations that are often lobbed against Israel. Now, Douglas, thank you so much for being with us. Great pleasure. You've been spending a considerable amount of time in Israel here. What motivated you to, to be involved and, and to have an interest in this conflict, particularly after October 7th? Well, one thing is I've, I've tried to be in Israel during every conflict since the first one I covered, which was the 2006 war. And um, there's lots of reasons why I, I realized as soon after the 7th as possible I needed to, to come to Israel. One is that I think there's just generally an enormous lack of empathy in the international community about Israel, about what Israelis have gone through, and specifically what they were going, what, what we knew what they had gone through on the 7th. And I, I knew immediately that two things would happen. One would be that the world's attention by the 8th would be on Israeli response, Israeli counteroffensive, and that the 7th was at risk of being lost in the minds of the international community, certainly, although not here in Israel. The second thing is my experience of covering wars here, as elsewhere, is you have to see things with your own eyes, not least because people will tell you that things you've seen with your own eyes you did not see. And so I knew that would happen. I knew we'd have denialism and much more. And uh, so, yes, I've been here since October, um, making what I now refer to as non-Jewish aliyah. Very good, very good. Well, you're welcome any time here. You're very popular <laughs> you. here in Israel. Now, you've, you've been in Gaza several mm -hmm. times. Uh, you've seen, uh, you know, from UNRWA to the hospitals to everything going on. What is your response to this abuse of civilian infrastructure and facilities by the terror organization Hamas? Well, you know, it's something that most Israelis have been aware of for years, of course. You know, UNRWA and various other international organizations simply aren't what they say they are. Now, uh, most Israelis knew that already. It's been reinforced and how in recent weeks. Again, outside of this country, I'm not sure how widely known or understood that is. Uh, admittedly, with UNRWA, the other week we finally saw a withdrawal of funding, including from European governments, which I didn't expect. Finally. Uh, I, thought they, <laughs> I, I thought they would just keep funding in spite of the evidence. Um, so, yes, it's an example, actually, that of the, the dial moving slightly outside of Israel. Uh, a recognition outside of Israel of the reality of the situation. You see, it's my belief that outside of Israel, much of the international community, including this country's allies, behave uh, in a totally dead paradigm. You know, they, they, we see it at the moment with uh, David Cameron and Anthony Blinken. We see it with Rishi Sunak and uh, Joe Biden doubling down on the two-state solution. You know, they've been doing this dead song for decades. And it's my view that, that the rest of the world needs to catch up with reality. The reality that Israel is in and the reality that the rest of the world is in. Israel has woken up to reality, for better or worse. The rest of the world uh, still slumbers. Now, one of the things we've seen crop up now, and actually every time there's been an operation here in Israel, but especially now, is the demonstrations. Mm -hmm. You're from London. You've seen a lot of been what, what's been going on with these, frankly, pro-terror sure. demonstrations, um, most recently pro-Houthi, mm -hmm. uh, with yeah, what's yeah. going on with the U.S. and U.K. strikes. They never, they never see a terrorist they don't like. Exactly, exactly. Houthi. They just learned Houthi, most of <laughs> these people. Ah. And then they're chanting for Yemen, chanting yeah, for yeah, Yemen. Yeah. If, you're, if you support Yemen, you should be against the Houthis, but that's yeah. lost on them, apparently. Uh, what, what do you think the UK should be doing when it comes to these pro-terror demonstrations? And even in, in some cases, we've seen violence, we've seen yeah. clear-cut anti-Semitism. Yeah. Uh, of course, I mean, I, I've said from the beginning, these marches are an outrage. Uh, they're not just marches against Israel, that's bad enough. They're also marches against Britain and against America. They're against the West. When, when Houthi terrorists fire missiles at British and American vessels in the Red Sea, if you're on the streets of Washington or London within the week praising those people, 
you're not just praising people who launch rockets at Israel. You're praising people who are launching rockets at our ships. So the, these demonstrations are not just anti-Jewish, which they are, anti-Israeli, which they are. They're anti-Western, they're anti-British, they're anti-American. So my view has been from the beginning, the incitement on the marches, the anti-Semitism on the marches should have mean that after one week, you've made your point, go home. It's perfectly possible to do that. The French president banned marches in France. He does not want the center of Paris to be shut down every week. Uh, the British government hasn't had the courage to do that. And indeed, the why, Home... Why is that? Well, one reason is that the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, who, who identified that, who said these are hate marches, she uh, eventually was, was edged out of her job. She was, she was edged out of her job, fired, sacked, because she correctly identified that these are hate marches. So, at a very deep level in the British government, and remember, it's a so-called conservative government, uh, at a very deep level, the British government doesn't want to act against this. Now, why? I would say, among other things, a very straightforward one. They're cowards. Would you say the same thing in response to the, the refusal to deal with Iran? You know, Iran is really behind, or the Islamic Republic, I should yeah. correct myself, is behind all of these proxy groups, Hamas, yeah. the Houthis, uh, uh, and they still haven't designated the IRGC, which has the, been an ongoing debate. The IRGC has been operating in the UK and in the US and found to be doing so in recent months. There was, there's a very, very brilliant uh, young uh, female dissident from Iran who's had some prominence in recent years, uh, there was an attempt by Iranian proxies to kill her in New York. Yeah. Now, just think about this. Anyone who doesn't realize, again, Israel's first, everyone else next. Seems obvious to me. I've written about this in book after book, article not after Israel. Not only that, they've said it themselves. They say it themselves. It's not like we make this up and put it in their mouths. It's <laughs> all from them. Yeah. We just have to listen to them. Now, Israelis, it seems to me, realize the, the, the classic line, you know, if somebody says they want to annihilate, you believe them. Israelis believe that. They recognize that. The majority of Israelis believe that. The majority of people in Britain and America, they sleep on. They're cowards and they're scared. And there's one good reason that they're scared, which is they don't know what to do. They don't know what to do because successive generations of British politicians have imported very large numbers of people from the Muslim world who imbibe the anti-Semitism from the cradle. Uh, there's a Muslim commentator who's no friend of mine called Mehdi Hassan, who want, wrote one truthful piece in his career about 10 years ago. He wrote a piece in which he said, anti-Semitism is the Muslim community's dirty little secret. He said, go to any Muslim dinner table and it comes up. Now, I'm saying that that is what a prominent Muslim anti-Israeli person admitted once. He let, the, he let it slip. Now, that's the truth. These people in the UK, who the UK has imported, we've imported a new generation of anti-Semites. Germany, which didn't need more anti-Semites, has imported a new generation of anti-Semites. And the question now is, what do you do about it? What do you do when a couple of hundred thousand people, mainly Muslim, come out onto the streets of London on a Saturday and the number of people protesting is almost as many as there are Jews in the UK. How do Jews in the UK feel about that? And my, my question always is not just how Jews feel about that in the UK, but how should the UK feel about this? How should we feel about the fact that our Jewish friends and neighbors and loved ones feel unsafe taking their children into the center of London Saturday after Saturday? I say it's an outrage. I say it has to stop. Moving a little bit to the universities, which have seen ha had similar demonstrations in the United States, Canada, England, of course, uh, we've seen a lot of support for terrorism on this cam these campuses, and we've also seen a lot of foreign funding from Qatar, yes. which, interestingly enough, has been very much involved with this war in particular. Yes. Um, what have you learned about the role of Qatar and, and what we're seeing on universities and the connection mm. between this war on the ground that you've seen in Gaza yourself yes, and I, what's happening on campus? Qatar is such a, an extraordinary case. Um, it, of course, is currently presenting itself as a broker. Um, which is hilarious in one way. I mean, also independent media, of course, Al Jazeera, but of that's course, a... <laughs> very, very, very independent. Yes. Al Jazeera. The point with, with Qatar is they pretend to be the power broker now, the peace broker. They're only in this position 
because they've been hosting the Taliban, hosting Hamas, hosting their leadership for all of these years. Qatar basically behaves like a, a mob boss who knocks on your door and says, you know, look, I'm not going to hurt you, but my friend here, I'm holding him back. That's how they operate. Mm -hmm. My thing with Qatar is they believe Qatar has poured hundreds of millions of dollars into the US and the UK to um, universities in particular. They made a $10 billion promise of further investment in the UK recently. But here, here's my thing on this. Qatar thinks that they are buying up us in the West. I want the paradigm to shift. I want Qatar to be taught that they don't own us. In fact, they're very vulnerable. Qatar, I, I've, I've been there. It's a few hundred thousand people who have a slave-owning uh, society. And they have a few million slaves who they treat in appalling circumstances. Um, nevertheless, you know, they bought FIFA, they bought the World Cup, so they think they can buy everyone. Well, in the wake of what uh, has been done in the West, whether you agree with the sanctions on Russia or not, the, the way in which the West showed that you can seize oligarchs' yachts, you can seize ill-gotten gains, I think we should hint, at the very least, Qatar, you're next. I would like to see that change. And when I hear Joe Biden or David Cameron lecturing Israel about what it should do, I would like Israel uh, to lecture them a bit back. You know, come back and tell us how we should organize our society. Mm -hmm. When you are absolutely sure you've got your one spick and span, as we would say in England. Right. Uh, you, as long as you're not compromised, as long as you're not, for instance, in America, giving billions of dollars to the terrorists in Tehran, Fine, we'll listen to you. Oh, you are. Oh, you are. <laughs> maybe um, check that first. <laughs> maybe check that first before you tell us how to do uh, things that would be suicidal for Israel. Now, a lot of Israelis have been frustrated with, and in the Jewish community, not just Israelis, with the calls for ceasefire and the lack of focus on the fact there's over 100 hostages still in Gaza in the hands of terrorists. What has your response been to these, these calls for ceasefire? Well, I, I mean, there were calls for ceasefire before Israel had done anything. On October 8th. October yeah. the 8th. I, was actually at a, I went to cover a demonstration in Times Square in New York on the 8th. And there were people, not just uh, hijab-wearing women waving signs celebrating what had happened on the 7th, the day before, celebrating in, in Times Square. Uh, but there were all these people calling, first of all, for um, a defeat of Zionism by any means necessary. Okay, that's a call to terror. That's a call to terror. And also, of course, a call for a ceasefire. Israel had not fired anything. And there was a form of ceasefire on the 6th. Not, a, not by any means a perfect one, but a form of it. I think it requires a special type of coward to start a war and then when you respond, say, oh, all we want is peace. All we want is peace. No, no. Uh, we wouldn't accept that in any other situation. Uh, when Great Britain or America has been attacked, uh, we do not believe, or at least I hope we don't believe, that we should just sit back and take it. Uh, we fight back. And we don't fight back just to send a lesson. We fight back to win. Mm -hmm. um, whenever Britain has been involved in a war, we have tried to win the war. We've not tried to play it to a draw. You know, we don't believe that nil-nil or one-one is the satisfactory situation. You it's believe funny, in a whenever win. people speak about proportionality, of course, that's a principle of international law and it has a distinct meaning in certain situations, but most people don't know that. And so when they think about yeah. proportionality, they think, well, if Hamas does X, then Israel must do the only the equivalent. But the equivalent is not something we want to see, <laughs> much no. less do. No, I pointed out very early in the conflict that if, if, we, if people want to have this obsession about proportionality, then that would mean that Israel would be allowed to rape exactly the number of women as were raped on the 7th and call it quits. Yep. Kill the same number of babies exactly as were killed on the 7th and call it quits. I don't think so. That whole notion of proportionality is nonsense. And again, we don't do it. We don't do it in conflict. When ISIS sent its fighters in to carry out terror attacks in Paris, the French government did not decide that the response of the French Air Force, along with their British and American counterparts, was to kill precisely the same number of people as were massacred at the Bataclan Theatre in Paris. They carried out bombing raids for months. And when people went into Mosul, they did not look at proportionality. 
What was the objective? The defeat of ISIS. And ISIS pretty much was defeated. It was certainly chased out of its strongholds. Why, when that is our way of war, in the rest of the West, in France, in Britain, and in America, why should we expect Israel to wound its enemy, but not to defeat it? And I don't know, other than weakness, the, the total invertebrate nature of politicians and others in the West who've been lulled into this idea that we will live in peace for the future, forever. Other than that, I, I see no reason why people should follow this totally, totally nonsensical view that you're allowed to kind of hit back a bit, but not defeat your enemy. No, you should be allowed to defeat your enemy. Yeah, necessary, even for self-defense purposes in, in our situation. Now, you've written many books. Uh, you've written extensively about the problem of immigration, which you touched on a little bit before. I'm wondering if uh, your time since October 7th here in Israel, do you see this conflict not just as something between Israel and Hamas, but connected to the greater threat of Islamism, of, of this extreme political Islam that, that we've seen crop up in, in many terror organizations? Uh, of course. I mean, um, sometimes people uh, criticize me and say, oh, you know, you're being too broad brushstroke in your criticisms of this. A, a, a claim that I, I deny, I, I understate the case, if anything, in, in the Western countries these days. Um, but look, anyone who doesn't think there's a pro problem within Islam doesn't have enough Muslim friends. Because if you had any Muslim friends, you would know they all know that. They all know that. They all know they have a big problem in their religion, in their communities. Why do you think that there's such a reluctance to admit that there may be a problem in some of these communities? I well, mean, and it goes for, for the issue of extremism, but also on October 7th. You know, you mentioned we've seen rape denials. We've seen a denial that some of the barbarity that we know happened because Hamas took video of it. Mm -hmm. They've denied it. How, well, how does that add up? I mean, is this just cognitive dissonance? What uh, uh, lots of things. I mean, really, it's a job for a psychiatrist to analyze. But they, some, people, some people who are Muslims in the West don't want to believe it. The second one is people who don't want to accept that the cause they're supporting would do something so appalling. See, and I find that group very interesting. That's Muslims and non-Muslims. The one who've been doing free Palestine, yeah, they, they do this, you know. Those people have a, had a big moral uh, conundrum on the 7th, which most of them have publicly failed. And the moral conundrum is, do I continue su to support this side and just push this aside? Like, <sighs> OK, enough. I, uh, I'll find a way around it. Or do you confront it? Now, an honest person, a decent person, would confront it. They would say, for instance, I've, somebody might say they'd supported the Palestinian cause all their life, but this is the thing that will set us back, so we have to find a way to get Hamas out of our movement. That would be what a decent and honest person would do. So why has there been so much denial? It's because they don't want to do that job. They either don't want to do the moral job, of actually seeing through the problem, mm -hmm. or it's all tactical. And as I said, some of the banners in Times Square on the 8th, by any means necessary. Some of these people really mean that. They really mean that. And they mean it on the streets of New York and London and elsewhere. And I think we have to call that out. You mean, you, by any means necessary? You mean you go to a party of young people in the early morning and you gun them down? You rape them? That's any means necessary. Most human beings at that point, if they've got any moral core, would say, perhaps my side is in the wrong. I think uh, some self-reflection is certainly, certainly required. I think I probably can count on one hand the number of uh, self-declared pro-Palestinian activists who have actually said, no, no, <laughs> right. this is not what we support. But isn't that There's amazing? There's a few, but not enough. It's amazing, isn't yeah. it? You would have thought if there was any decency in that movement, they wouldn't have found that hard. Yeah. If, if uh, goodness knows, if it came out that IDF soldiers had been raping babies in Gaza, which they haven't, but if there was evidence that that came out, the irrefutable evidence, and they were proud of it, and they showed it, we would not simply ignore that. Of course not. We would, it would be night after night, and Israeli news would be covering it, and every Israeli would be condemning it. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. 
So we know that. So what is the sickness on the other side that also is willing seeing, to accept that? Also seeing a lot of excuse making. Uh, you know, yes, October 7th was bad, but occupation. Mm. Which, interestingly, I spoke to a lot of students in New York about this recently, mm. and, and the, the reaction was, oh, occupation, occupation. And I, I pointed out that October 7th was carried out within Israel proper. This is not disputed right. territory. Uh, well, those people so, might think it is, of course. Of course. They might think that all of Israel is disputed yeah. territory. And I think that's what we're seeing. A lot of people saying, I don't accept Israel's right to exist, period. And well, that's a very dangerous uh, place to be. It's a very dangerous place to be. And I'm worried, I, I think, that actually is actually where the pro-Palestinian movement has now reached. It is from the river to the sea. It is, mm -hmm. it is annihilate Israel. Which, as I always say, by the way, particularly for the social justice warriors on the left in America, I pray that they never see their dreams fulfilled. Because if they ever did, they would have finished the work of Adolf Hitler. And I, I would pity somebody who'd lived their lives and ended up in that place. But, um, yes, this requires remorseless criticism in the meantime. Uh, and when they say that this is the inevitable response to occupation, there's one particularly important question you must ask them, in my view. When did you last hear of a Greek Cypriot suicide bomber? Have you heard of any? <laughs> no. No, I haven't either. I keep my ears and eyes out for it. It doesn't happen. Now, Turkey is illegally occupying the north of Cyprus, has done for 50 years. Turkey is not only a member of NATO, but Cyprus is a member of the e European Union. The land was stolen from the Cypriots by the Turks. Yet, Despite this occupation that the world has not had any interest in since it happened, or a very small number of people, the Cypriots do, and a few others, despite that, we have seen no suicide bombers from Cyprus. We do not see Cypriot schoolchildren taught that their purpose in life should be to go and kill a Turk. We do not see mothers of Turkish, of, of, of Cypriot children who go and blow something up saying how proud they would be of it. No. None of this happens. So why do, they, why do these people you speak to on American campuses think that suicide bombing and rape and the murder of children is a perfectly understandable response to an Israeli occupation that, by the way, is not, it does not happen? Mm -hmm. uh, these people, presumably, these uh, 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 Americans you speak to, presumably think that the Palestinians are just a people so completely erratic uh, that they have to blow themselves up or there's nothing to do. Um, I would have a slightly higher view of the Palestinians than those people who claim to support them. Uh, last question, and it's a simple one. Do you believe the West can win, can still win? It can win if it follows Israel's example. It can win if it follows Israel's example. Uh, this generation of Israelis, many, uh, many people I know who are veterans of previous wars in Israel, 14, 67, 73, and so on, often said to me, ah, oh, maybe the younger generation is weak in Israel. You know, they all they <laughs> like to party in Tel Aviv, they spend their time on Instagram and TikTok. You know, if we needed a war again like this, would they step up? The amazing news of this conflict is, wow, have they stepped up. The young men and women of Israel, wow, have they stepped up. And it's such a privilege to see them, to meet them, and to see them dedicated to this mission of protecting their country and their people. Would that the generations and their contemporaries in Britain, France, America, have the same standing if the time ever came? You know, people say, what should Israel learn from the West? I say, what should the West learn from Israel? It should learn courage, determination, survival, and much, much more. Courage is the main one, courage in the face of enemies. Moral courage. Physical and moral courage. Yes. I come from a country that liked to pride itself on having a quiet form of courage. I don't know where it's gone, but I don't think it's disappeared. It can be coaxed back. Well, hopefully you're right. Uh, I want to thank you for taking the time to, to discuss all this with us. And of course, for all of the work and your, and your coverage and your reporting of, of what's happening here in Israel. I know I speak on behalf of many Israelis uh, when I say thank you for that. Well, thank you.